All right, good morning. It is February 19th, 2019. My name is Katie Shank, and today I'm here with Sonny Dixon to conduct an interview for the Two-Party Georgia Oral History Project, sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Mr. Dixon was elected twice to the Garden City, Georgia City Council, then elected to five terms in the Georgia House of Representatives, where he represented West Chatham County from 1989 to 1997. In the House of Representatives, he served on key committees, appropriations, rules, transportation, reappointment, industry, and interstate cooperation. He chaired the State Highway Subcommittee on Transportation. In 2002, the Georgia legislator voted to rename the intersection of State Route 21 and Jimmy DeLoach Parkway, the Sonny Dixon Interchange, in his honor. After his career in politics, Mr. Dixon was a broadcast journalist, working as a lead anchor of the news at 5 and 6 and WTOC Prime on WTOC TV, which is a CBS affiliate in Savannah, Georgia. He was there from 2001 until 2015. He is the only Savannah anchor to win the Best Anchor Emmy Award. He has also won numerous AP awards and an Edward R. Murrow Award. Dixon was selected as Savannah's favorite media personality 14 years in a row by readers of Savannah Magazine. Mr. Dixon is a strong supporter of the U.S. military and was named an honorary Night Stalker, which is part of the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment by the Secretary of the Army. He was also designated an honorary U.S. Army Ranger and an honorary member of the 3rd Combat Aviation Brigade of the 3rd Infantry Division. Dixon was presented with the Freedom Award by the Veterans Council of Chatham County for consistent support of military veterans and their families. Mr. Dixon, I'm looking forward to speaking with you today about your career in politics and journalism, and especially about the shifts in Georgia's political landscape, shifts that were very noticeable during your time in office. Um, it'll be fascinating to hear the perspective of someone who served as a politician and then went on to work in news media. Today, those two fields are often presented as working in opposition to one another, but I imagine you have a more nuanced take on their relationship. I don't know about nuance, but we'll see. <laughs> so let's start first with some biographical information. Tell us about yourself, your parents, where you were born, where you went to school. Well, I'll back check a little bit on this. These are probably my typos in everything that I ever did or made up about myself. And thank you for the details, although it's a, a little red-faced in hearing it. <laughs> I actually, it was reapportionment committee I was on, and I, I think it said reappointment there, but uh, re reapportionment committee, which I, I trust will dwell on a bit because I would contend that in the great pivotal periods in Georgia's party system, whether it's two or three or more, mm -hmm. uh, the, the pivotal years since the war between the states were, you know, the 1870s, 1948, 1964, and the early 90s. And mm -hmm. I was extremely vocal during the process in the early 90s. So. Uh, there's that, and I mm -hmm. trust we'll get to it. But sure. also, the I, I was at WTOC and was a from '97. There was a reason that I left the legislature a little early because there was a sale of the TV station, and they wanted me on board to go with the furniture, so the new company wouldn't have an opportunity to reject this atypical former political entity as an anchor. So okay. it was actually when I left the legislature, it was straight to WTOC in 1997 and I retired in 2005. So in, insignificant, but since this is a historical okay. project, I want to make sure that the record is sort of clear Not there Not insignificant well. at all. Yeah. I was born in Savannah in 1952. Uh, hottest summer on record. My mother and father lived in, in a little house with eight foot ceilings and no air conditioning. And consecutive days at 100 plus degrees. I was born in August, so my mother remained, I think, a little upset with me till the day <laughs> she passed two years ago. But I'm a, a somewhat parochial Savannian, proud of the history of Savannah, and uh, somewhat a student of Georgia's founder, James Edward Oglethorpe, and mm -hmm. sponsored a bill to establish uh, the James Edward Oglethorpe Tercentenary Commission in 1990. Six and a group of us, including Zell Miller and others, went to England and celebrated Jim Ed, as I call him, familiar, uh, familiarly. But from Savannah, and I'm descended from farmers, very agrarian background. I'm the first one in my family to be born in a city. Mm -hmm. Really, my mother's family was from tobacco farms of eastern North Carolina, and she married a Marine who was up there at Cherry Point. He from South Georgia, I'm the 10th generation, all rural, 
my family in Georgia began in Effingham County, down through Bullock, Tattnall, Candler, Evans, and on down to Pierce. I always say there was either a, <laughs> a bad debt or an unexplained pregnancy, but somebody had to move. <laughs> and, but it was very agrarian on both sides of the family. And yet my father said after he got out of the Marine Corps, I'm not working on the tobacco farms anymore. So he came to Savannah to work in the paper mills and my sister and I were born there. Uh, very proud of my roots in Savannah. And yet, what, during my high school years, he took a job with a paper mill in North Carolina, 30 miles from where my mother grew up. So I had a chance to indulge myself in her family, mm -hmm. just as I'd done in his for years and years. Went to college in Florida at the University of Florida, and uh, that's been a sore spot with a lot of people, but it's worked out well. You look nervous when you say that. <laughs> uh, well, where I'm sitting in the Richard B. Russell building, as much as I admire George's great senator and quote him often, uh, there's a little queasiness when I come on the campus of the University of Georgia. Our daughter, who when she was little said, you'd say, what do you want to be when you grow up? She'd say, Florida Gator cheerleader. <laughs> well, she's very, very smart. She was, when she got it, into high school, you know, it was all A's, 4.0 plus. So as a, at the top of her class graduated from high school, she was certainly eligible for the Hope Scholarship. And I'd always pictured her making good on that childhood promise of going to my alma mater. Mm -hmm. And uh, we sat there and did what I call a Benjamin Franklin balance sheet at the kitchen table, adding up the numbers. And even though I had some pull in the realm of the University of Florida, it was still a $16,000 differential per year in 1999. And uh, I sat there quietly checking my numbers, and she said, Daddy, say something. I said, go dogs. Woof, woof, woof. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't go to the University of Florida to learn how to be stupid, you know. Right. But uh, she graduated from Georgia, and it's, my, my wife keeps the two of us apart a week before and after a certain date in the fall of each year, because that's an intense rivalry. Woman. But uh, you're, you're making it very easy here to overcome the sweat in my palm oh, of being in enemy territory. Very good. Um, so when, when did you first become involved in politics? I, first of all, I had no interest or inclination. Well, that's not true. I've always had an interest in politics. Mm -hmm. And I found it interesting to see the viewpoints of my grandparents, uh, on my father's side, of course, in South Georgia, it was always hardcore, democratic, you know. They were products of the county unit system in Georgia mm -hmm. when the numbers were structured to favor the rural counties. And I remember my grandfather being very involved in the Georgia Farm Bureau involved with democratic politics. And he from Pierce County, where I, I, I suppose that's probably one of the most Republican counties in the state now, but you know, you'd have gotten shot. When I, when, in my childhood, when I watched my grandfather involve him, and grandmother involve themselves with politics, mm -hmm. and then my mother's mother in Washington, North Carolina, she loathed Republicans. And it wasn't just the old hatred of the stories you heard from your elders going all the way back to the days of Reconstruction mm -hmm. when Northern carpetbaggers came down and they, you know, they placed freed slaves into the offices and they were all Republicans. Yeah, those stories filtered down, but hers was rooted in the Depression. And she hated Herbert Hoover. She despised him. You didn't say the name of Herbert Hoover in her house because they'd gone through extreme hardships in the Depression, even in the rural areas where they could grow the food for themselves. Right. But if you had any outside enterprise, which they did, it just died mm -hmm. in the Depression. You lost money you'd saved. And there was a seething hatred of that. I, I think about it when this, the song by the uh, group Alabama, mm -hmm. there's a passage in there that says, Daddy was a veteran, a Southern Democrat. You ought to get a rich man to vote like that, singing song, song of the South. That was my grandmother on my mother's side. And she went to her grave vehemently hating Republicans. And that, I don't know, 
I think that took some root in me. But that, again, it just manifested itself in some of the votes I cast. I didn't harbor any of that polemical political view, except to the extent that it was in the back of my mind. Mm -hmm. But it, you know, up until I was recruited to run for office, I, I don't guess I ever voted a straight ticket. I've always been one who voted based upon the person I thought was best for the job. And it may have been Republican, Democrat, Independent, didn't matter. Sure. In the mid 80s, there was a push for a hospital in West Chatham County, which is the most rapidly growing area in terms of population and business in the Savannah area at the time. And that's mm -hmm. continued and proven very true. All of the predictions we made then in a campaign I'm about to tell you about have materialized. Uh, we wanted a hospital and I was the chairman of the West Side Hospital backers. And as you'll see, I am not af afraid to talk. And there were, literally there were folks who came to me then and said, oh, there was a man named Millage Jones who ran a lawnmower repair business in Garden City. Okay. And we went to church with him and he came up to me and said, you talk real good, and some of us don't. And we've been pushing for this for years, so we wondered if you'd just get up there and be our spokesperson. Well. So politics picked you. <laughs> yeah, the mayor of Garden City. Then uh, Ralph Kessler was handing the reins over to Jimmy Burnsett as the sort of anointed candidate, and fine men, solid, honorable people. Mm -hmm. They came to my house and said, would you consider going on city council? And I was stunned, you know. I, I really never thought of myself in that context, but I did. And, uh, you know, I, I tell people sometimes, take a look at me, I'm what happens when folks don't turn out to vote. <laughs> I got elected. And then a couple of years later, uh, Tom Triplett, who had been in the General Assembly for 18 years, decided he wasn't gonna run, run again. He had some family members with health issues and he just couldn't continue going off to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So he, same lightning struck again. He said, uh, next Thursday, I'm going to announce that I'm not running again and you're going to stand with me and announce that you are. I said, oh, hell no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and I got uh, probably three free lunches out of CNS Bank before I finally said, yes, I'd give it a go. I said, I committed to two terms. I said, if they'll have me, I will stay for two terms, but I have no interest in being in Atlanta. Well, I had primary opposition and general election opposition, a very, very rough general election in which I, the Republican opponent was brutal. He had some trouble in his background. He feared, I, I guess he suspected that I was going to exploit that as people are want to do in mm -hmm. politics. And yet I had this naive Pollyanna approach. I said, I do not believe in dirty politics. We'll not mention his name, we'll not be critical, we'll not have an ugly ad or anything. And we'd done with uh, Armstrong College at the time, Armstrong, well now it's Georgia Southern, mm -hmm. Armstrong campus. Some political science friends of mine helped me with uh, some polling because I didn't have really the money to do polling, but we, we crafted, you know, a universe and figured out how to do a little bit of uh, informal polling. And I was up five to one. He closed it to uh, five points by which I won. And I will never forget the poison gas campaign, the brutal assaults, and I never wavered from my commitment, but it was hard. Sure. And when I drove my uh, then six-year-old daughter to school one day and one of those ads came on the radio and I listened to it. I didn't even think about the impact it was having on my child and I looked over to her and tears were coming down her face. Oh, goodness. There was an anger and having and, and sticking to my commitment to keep it clean. I just I was furious. And some of that has stayed with me because the Republican Party, many of whom had been my good friends in Savannah, Chatham County, many of whom still are, but a lot of them refused to distance themselves from this man who had a terribly unsavory background. 
Uh, I ultimately introduced a law that stipulated that if you had a, an employment file that had been sealed in exchange for your resignation, as soon as you qualified for any office, it was immediately unsealed. He didn't know that. So he ran against a friend of mine for school board two years later, and I called the newspaper and said, here's a copy of the official code of Georgia number, blah, blah, blah. Open the file. Hit him. They opened the file, and he went away and has never been heard from again. Interesting. So, Isn't that, don't you hate this already? You asked me what time it is, I tell you how to make a watch. No, no, this is perfect. <laughs> So what, what platform did you run on then? You're running a positive campaign. What are you telling the people of Of Chatham myself? At, well, at the time, we were facing a lot of issues, and it was already clear that I had a great concern for health care, uh, certainly for uh, the potential trauma needs. We had railroad tracks that dissected the district, and I said, we've, we've got to come up with a transportation plan that gets the trucks off of some of the major corridors, that gets rid of some of the rail crossings. We have to be able to get an ambulance to the hospital. If we don't get a hospital in West Chatham County, we at least have to be able to get our people to hospitals in time if there's a bad accident or some other uh, tragedy. And Lord, how that proved true. And I did a lot of work in that area. I kept the promise. Mm -hmm. And it's vastly improved over what it was at the time. But I also had been the chairman, and this was one of the sources of the attacks I took. We hadn't built a new school in Chatham County since 1969, and there was a push for a bond referendum to build new schools. Very sizable, $179 million, and you know that was a bitter pill for folks in a conservative county to sure. face. And uh, they had, in, here we go with the recruiting again, the business brain trust of Savannah Chatham County and the school board. I think they had been through six people who they wanted to chair that campaign, all of whom turned it down because it was a hill too high. Mm -hmm. And they came to me and I thought about it for a week and finally said, you know what the heck, I'll do it. This was back in 87. Uh, but I didn't do it willy nilly. I, I researched, uh, Charlotte, Jacksonville, and other places who had been through the same thing, I said, you know what, we're going to get beat. But we're going to try to win. Don't, you know, I'm going to recruit, I'm going to push hard to raise money. We're going to wage a campaign because they need to learn about majority to minority transfers. They need to learn about magnet schools and things that we're utilizing to, to try to prevent the re-desegregation, you know, of the schools, and I know that's not a word, but nonetheless, moving back toward di dividing the races in the schools de facto, sure. we had to provide incentives for blacks to be able to come to white schools, whites to go to traditionally black schools, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we, we suffered only a narrow loss, and, and it has gone exactly the way I thought it would. We'd give them a good spleen venting, mm -hmm. and then they'd come back and uh, approve you know, they, it, people are by nature good. And if, they, if we had a chance to educate them on the real issues long term, it would settle in and in their heart of hearts, given a, maybe a scaled down opportunity to do something, they would approve it. And they did, and they have consistently with renewals through the years. So, yeah, it was tough waking up the morning after it was defeated. Sure. And I had fed the beast in terms of my opponent, whose name I still won't utilize, but he said I was trying to put old people out of their houses, raise taxes, and yada, yada, yada. But education was a primary thrust, and transportation, health care. One of the themes throughout my unanticipated political life kind of harkens back to the title of the first chapter in a book by the former U.S. Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill from Boston. He had, and it's axiomatic in politics now, and a lot of people don't know where it came from, but it was the first chapter. And the title was, All Politics is Local. Mm -hmm. So while I had in mind broad objectives on issues of general interest, or that needed to be of general interest, I sort of articulated those in terms of the impact on that burgeoning area of western Chatham County and the city of my birth, Savannah. 
That's what I offered and they bought it. And then I screwed the job up so bad that I never had another opponent. Nobody wanted it. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in thinking about all, all politics are local, you're, you're part of the state legislature though. What were some of the most important issues that faced all of Georgia at that time? Were they similar to what was facing West Chatham? They Did were, you feel there was a disconnect? Yeah, you know, you hear about the two Georgias, Atlanta and the rest of the state. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I found a need to become involved in was forming coalitions outside of Atlanta. I had, you know, I had great respect for Atlanta and supported those issues that were greatly important, the World Congress Center, MARTA. In fact, one of the things I had a modest hand in doing, and I wouldn't say that it was crucial, but nonetheless, it was an objective and I had more successes than failures in this regard, was, get, was trying to bridge that divide between Atlanta and the rest of the state and getting some of my colleagues especially from the rural areas, like those where my father and my grandfather and all of my ancestors on both sides of the family grew up, mm -hmm. to understand that if Atlanta succeeded, then the rest of the state benefited. If Georgia ports succeeded, then the rest of the state greatly benefited. We need to look at everything, even though all politics is local, and I understand you looking after your own, I do the same. But we need to figure out where we can help Fulton County and then help them to understand where they can help us with access to broadband internet, with support for small hospitals, because the golden hour is a very real thing after you have suffered an injury or the onset of a, of a crucial illness, mm -hmm. of an of a emergent issue there's a limited amount of time to get the healthcare. So we needed to figure, let, help them understand the real problems we had. Long story short, I got people talking. We sort of formed an urban, it was almost like the, the breakdown of the county unit system. You had the big cities, you know, mm -hmm. the towns who, you know, the, with a county unit system, and I trust we may get to that, I don't know, but. Uh, you had eight counties which had six votes each based upon the majority in any given election. That was under the county unit system. Then you had the towns, and there were 30 of those who got six votes each. And then you had the rest of the 159 counties who got two votes each. And you don't have to be much of a mathematician to see that the rural areas held sway up until 1962, from 1917 to 1962, when Griffin Bell heroically said, this isn't fair. We needed to, to get over some of the angst, some of the divide that still lingered after the county unit system was struck down and get the rural people to realize, hey, Atlanta is not a problem for us. It's a major asset the other Southern states would love to have. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the towns, the second cities, the Savannahs, the Augustas, Columbus, Macon, Albany, we needed to figure out a way to let them benefit from the economic boom that was Georgia then and is now. And you know what? I really was, I guess I was most gratified because I, I, I recognize I don't leap tall buildings with a single bound. I don't know how in the world you found my name down the list because if, it, if I was making up a list of people for you to talk to for this undertaking, I'd be so far down the list you couldn't see it from here. <laughs> But I did manage to do some things, and one of them was some, sometimes it was there were agreements reached in a fishing boat in Fayette County, where I'd be talking to X Y Z representatives from this small area, and they'd talk about how they hated Savannah and they hated Atlanta, and they weren't going to ever vote with them. I said, "Do you realize that if you just sit down, if we would come together, out state?" And, and recognize those things we have in common and then share that with the Fulton delegation and have them listen to us and we listen sincerely to them, we can find common ground. You, you might not be so far off as We can imagine. help them. You know, I, 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 my constituents might not have liked the funding measures. I, shoot, I moved for funding measures for MARTA Mm -hmm. that I'm sure would not have been popular in Pooler, Georgia, which I represented. 
But guess what? Tyrone Brooks, my good friend from Atlanta, who has hit some snags of late, but he did a lot of good working for his constituents. Mm -hmm. Tyrone Brooks became a champion for Georgia Ports in Savannah. You know, it's, people denigrate the idea of you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And that does sound bad when you put it that way. But at the same time, if you engage the dialogue mm -hmm. and people listen to you and you listen to them, very often you can work together when previously you did not. Can actually move things and, forward. Pr exactly. And I, maybe it was that naivete that I had previous to getting into politics that lingered on. I just didn't have any better sense than to do it otherwise. That, you know, than to try it, I mean. It's, yeah. And it worked more often than not. How, how do you see things today? Awful. Is, Terrible. People are not having that same no. spirit of talking and... You know, when I, when I got into the... I always say in retrospect that I got in at the right time and I got out at the right time. Going in in the late 80s, the Georgia House, and I'm speaking of the legislature primarily, because mm -hmm. Garden City Council was just a wonderful family doing good deeds, you know. It was like a board of deacons at the church. It was it, a little bit different. It was than very state different. Level. And it was nonpartisan. Uh, but when I got into the realm of the legislature, there were 30 maybe 35, I don't remember the count, 30 some odd Republicans out of uh, 180 members in the House. And yet there was enough diversity in the Democratic Party. There were flamethrowers on each side, but there were also people of goodwill who were there for the right reasons. Johnny Isaacson was the minority leader, a dear friend of long standing, 30 years, a Republican, but such a wonderful, intelligent, great servant of the state of Georgia, and, and so many others like him. And we would sit down in the ante room, or over supper, or in a hospitality suite in a hotel, and it didn't matter, urban, rural, black, white, male, female, Republican, Democrat. When we just sit down there in a living room type conversation, we got, we, we got down to the bottom line on so many issues with respect. Mm -hmm. And we might hammer away in a debate on the floor of the house or in a committee or subcommittee. Sure. But then we'd go to lunch and we'd laugh and we knew each other's children and spouses. And some of my best friends in life were from the opposite caucus. And I just don't see that now. And I'm told by friends of mine who are still there, they say, Sonny, you just wouldn't believe how bad it is. And I hear that from Republicans and Democrats. I used to hear that about Congress and still do. But State Georgia Congress. was, no, about yeah. the Congress in Washington. Mm -hmm. and, I, we, and we would say, well, at least we, we don't have that problem in Georgia. We know who the nut jobs are in each caucus and we avoid them like the plague. But we also know that regardless of all those things I mentioned a moment ago, race, gender, and party. Mm -hmm. We're all good folks trying to do the same th the things, good for the state of Georgia. We might have differences on how we would go about it, but we can discuss it mm -hmm. civilly. Mm -hmm. uh, that is not necessarily the case now. It's a lot more harsh from what I hear from people on both sides of the aisle. Sure. So I, we've touched on this a little bit, but there was an article um, in the Atlanta Magazine in 2015. Peter Applebaum, who's a former New York Times Atlanta bureau chief, it's called Red State Rising, The Last Days of Georgia's Two-Party System. And he opens it by writing, Georgia politics in the 1990s was like a murky twilight zone with two galaxies spinning away from each other. So you, you were right in the middle of this twilight zone. That's when you served. Um, and you'd mentioned few numbers. When you were first a state representative in 1989, uh, there were 144 Democrats and 36 Republicans in, in the House of Representatives. I was close. During your final term, you were very close. During your final term in 1997, there were 104 Democrats and 76 Republicans. So that's a shift of 40 seats. And the Senate is much the same. Republicans more than doubled their seats. They went from 11 seats in 89 to 23 in 1997. So 
what was it like to be in the legislature during such a noticeable shift? Could you could you feel the the importance of what was happening at the time, or or did it not feel so big because, like you said, people were still sitting down and talking through issues? I, I can speak very directly to that because I was on the reapportionment committee, as you mentioned at the outset. And the reason I was on reapportionment was because I was the only freshman member of the Chatham County delegation when I was elected. And, and there was somewhat of a divide between West Chatham County and the, and the city of Savannah when it came to transit funding and education funding and so forth, a little bit of a, and it's still somewhat that way. Different interests, different priorities. Yeah, yeah. and uh, you know, an anti-Savannah sentiment in Garden City, Pooler, Port Wentworth, Bloomingdale, and the unincorporated area of Western Chatham County. And uh, I've pretty well felt that in reapportionment, which was upcoming, you know, I, my first, I was elected in 88, took office 89, uh, the decennial census in 1990 to be followed by redistricting, and I could just feel the rest of the Chatham delegation eyeing portions of my district, divided up so that they could pay, basically still that voice from Western Chatham County. Part of that was because my predecessor was so effective. Mm -hmm. Tom Triplett was extremely effective, and in that way, sometimes you could say there was some good-natured chicanery in the way he went about his business. And, and there was some ill will built up by long-term members of the General Assembly from Chatham County in the city of Savannah or in eastern Chatham, the islands. So I thought, oh my God, I, my people, my district will be targeted. So I went to the speaker. I, you know, I'm a Democrat. I was encouraged strongly by my predecessor to he, he said, as a freshman, keep your mouth shut and your pen in your pocket because things are not necessarily the way you think they are from the outset. You need to learn where the power lies. Committee chairman, movers and shakers, sometimes things happen differently than you think they will as you observe it from the outset. I did exactly what he said. We had dynamic young freshmen who came in, guns a-blazing like some of the new Congress people we see right now in, mm -hmm. in, in Washington. And I think about the fact that yeah, and these, uh, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and WSB were doing stories on the bright and shining stars of the freshman class of 1989, and I was quiet, which I'm sure you would find hard to believe as much as I, as verbose as I am. I can't help it. You know, my grandmother said, talk before he walked, his tongue will be his ruin, and that was true. But I did exactly as I was counseled to, and it was the best advice I ever had, sit back and watch. To really learn how things work and how you could have an impact. Exactly, and even though Tom Murphy was greatly misunderstood by a lot of people in Georgia, he, I think he intentionally set himself up as a lightning rod. He would sometimes be so gruff and harsh, and people outside the Capitol resented him, and a lot of people ran for office to take on Murphy. But they'd get in and realize he's got a mind like a computer, and in many respects, he's being very pragmatic about what he does. He knows that if what he does is satisfactory to the people of the 18th district in Harrelson and surrounding counties west of Atlanta, and satisfactory to the Democratic caucus, then it doesn't matter what people outside of those two realms, think of him. Mm -hmm. And in so doing, he could become, he could absorb the blows and protect his people in the house from taking them themselves. And therefore they could more comfortably vote for things that could be controversial, like millions of dollars for the Georgia World Congress Center or for Atlanta roads. Everybody would say, mm, Atlanta's getting all the money. And anyway, there's a purpose behind this. I ingratiated myself to the speaker. I proved my loyalty. Uh, toughest vote of all. We had the federal government ready to take over our prison system because it was overcrowded ridiculously. Mm -hmm. And they said, okay, Georgia, either you remedy this problem 
or we're going to come in and fix it and send you the bill. So Joe Frank Harris, who was governor at the time, couldn't figure any other way to fix it but an increase in the sales tax. We went from three cents to four cents, which was the biggest tax increase in the history of the state of Georgia by a mile. Here I go as a Democratic representative of a Republican district. They had optimum Republican voter strength numbers, they called it Orvis. And I was the, the, the highest Orvis number, the most Republican district still represented by a Democrat. And I hate to admit that I was so timorous at that moment, but I was. I went to the speaker and said, listen, I wasn't looking for this job, but now that I have it, I can see some things I'd kind of like to try to do. Mm -hmm. If I vote for this, I'm done. That's it. And the speaker said, I, I said, can, can I take a walk? Can I just miss the vote? He said, I, I, I've only come to know you a little while, but I, 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 I respect you. This is Tom Murphy, the two of us in an office, and he's telling little old me, I respect you. You have strength of conviction. You articulate your views very well. You have a well-shaped set of principles. What a, what a you will compliment. not be able to live with yourself. Tell me what else we're going to do. Tell me how we're going to fix this. I said, I don't know of any other way. He said, well, then why won't you vote for it? I said, Mr. Speaker, really? I'll get thrashed. And he said, no, you won't. You stay on the right side of local issues and you'll be fine. There you go again. All Everything's politics local. local. I sat there and they called for the vote. I'll never forget it. My hands were shaking. So it's embarrassing to admit that in that moment I was so weak. But because that's just not my nature. I usually I'll just do it you know, come hell or high water. Mm -hmm. But I really had developed a list of things I wanted to do. I had realized that from that position I could do them better than being out of it. So as I reach for that green button, I, I, I don't think you'll mind me saying it now because it was a true conversation. Jack Kingston, state representative from the eastern side of Chatham County, my good friend and a staunch Republican, was seated next to me. I said, okay, here it goes. And they said, he was ready to say, clerk will lock the machine. And at the very last, I hit the green button. Whew. He said, you know, Jack said, you know, there really is no alternative. It has to be done. Mm -hmm. And he hit his red button. Forgive me, you can edit this out, but I gotta be exact. I turned to him and I said, you are such a chicken shit. How in the world can you tell me you know this is all we can do? And we laughed about it. But then I sat that night, I sat, uh, took it to my pillow and I thought, well, I can't be down on Jack. I was just as wimpy about it. And it kind of reminded me, or, or no, it didn't remind me, it taught me that a lot of the decisions are going to be very hard. And sometimes you just got to buck up and do it. Mm -hmm. Well, you asked me a question, and here I have gone way around the bend to come back to it. I had gone to the speaker and said, listen, the guys in Savannah are going to tear my district apart. So he said, I'm going to put you on reapportionment and not let any of them on it, and we'll take care of it. <laughs> well, as it turned out, they were, I was wrong. The rest of the delegation were wonderful people, no matter what. We became hard, fast friends, and they weren't going to do me in. But, mm -hmm. but there here, was that fear. Yeah, that... there was. So here I am on reapportionment. My local issue settled. I began to take the broader view. And it didn't take me long to see that I had a purpose for being there. Mm -hmm. You know, is it? People of various philosophical or spiritual bents will tell you all things happen for a reason and they come at it from different objectives. But to me, it felt like, okay, I, I got on this thing to just look after my one little district and my own interests. But I see that I have a purpose on this thing. So now we get to what you ask about, the great pivot mm -hmm. in Georgia politics forever, or at least for a life, for a generation. We went for a hearing in 
southwest Georgia somewhere, I don't recall exactly, the very first person to testify before the reapportionment committee regarding congressional redistricting was the chairman of the Republican Party, Poitras. And he articulated a viewpoint based upon sections two and five of the Voting Rights Act. He, he, he preached to us about how important it was that we do nothing that had the purpose or effect of limiting minority voting strength. And I began to learn an awful lot. And I, I thought, this is screwed up. You got the chairman of the Republican Party articulating issues related to African Americans, which has really generally not been very high on the priority list of Republicans. Right. And I soon saw why. There formed then a coalition of Republican leadership and some in the African-American community, not everybody, but in fact, it was a minority of the minority that said, let me see if I can say this clearly because it's extremely important. They basically said, you have to not just do nothing that has the purpose or effect of diluting minority voting strength, you have to optimize the minority voting strength within as many districts as possible. So we developed terms like influence districts. This was where you had a significant number of African-Americans or non-whites. In Georgia, it was of course primarily African-Americans, but there were a number of Latin Americans and other Asians and mm -hmm. others who who didn't necessarily identify themselves with traditional white Georgia viewpoints. There were some cold, hard realities that I struggled to come to understand. One of them was, what, how do we arrive at the answer of what constitutes an effective majority minority district? Well, in general, in politics throughout my life, it had always been and is now 50% plus one is a majority. Mm -hmm. That's enough. But no. And, and I came to understand it. I didn't necessarily agree with the increments, but it wasn't my place to challenge them. The argument was that because the African-American population was younger than the white population, you needed to add 5% to, to the 50% okay. to accommodate that fact. And then because after literally centuries of disenfranchisement and decades, just a matter of decades since the Voting Rights Act, African Americans were less likely to register to vote, you built in 5% for that. And then because of those who were registered to vote, considerably more African-Americans would simply not go to the polls and therefore you had to build in 5% for that. Well, truly, I, I was so puzzled over it. 65% became the working number for an effective majority minority district. Wow. And then I began to see the reasoning behind Mr. Poitras petition to the committee. He wanted to so concentrate African-Americans within districts that it just basically bleached the remaining areas, overwhelming white majorities, almost certain based upon empirical information to elect Republicans. I hated that idea. And I didn't, I didn't set out to be the most vocal opponent but it just happened. I think, as you can see, I have a hard time keeping my mouth shut. When it comes to something you believe in. It was, it was an, I, I said, this is injustice. just not right. This is going to divide us unnecessarily. It's going, to, it's going to engender a radical change in the way we handle the state's business. Mm -hmm. uh, Cynthia McKinney was probably the primary there was there was there were the Brooks McKinney 
uh, plans that were submitted. And, and Cynthia had been a good friend of mine and remained that way, although we really crossed swords over this issue. Tyrone Brooks, who, I mean, I really liked Tyrone Brooks. He and I were very good friends and still are. Mm -hmm. But we differed on this. I, I could hardly talk to Cynthia about it because I, she was young and brash like I was. And, but Tyrone was older and wiser, and we could sit and discuss it. I said, do you not see what's going to happen? You're going to wind up with three, maybe four districts where a black is almost certain to win election. But is that really what you want? Do you want the remaining seven or eight members of the, you know, we were right on the border of whether or not we were going to get another congressman. Mm -hmm. I said, do you want the remaining members of the congressional delegation to have no incentive whatever to go to the Martin Luther King Jr. Day breakfast or parade. They don't have to consider your concerns. And, I, and I, it's, it's probably going to force the representatives from these districts to embrace a point of view which may be foreign to their own hearts. You know, you, they, they may wind up in a situation where they can't take the local view, which they can easily determine from listening to blacks and whites together within their cities. That was the case in Savannah. You know, mm -hmm. they, they, may, they may have done something totally different if the community was allowed to make decisions together, black and white, than they were forced to make if you just literally ran districts down riverbeds and railroad tracks to extract a portion of the community and put it in a district controlled by someone far away. That's what really got me upset because we wound up with the 11th congressional district proposed, which went from Piedmont Park in Atlanta to Forsyth Park in Savannah. Listen, look, I still get upset about it. Our people, our, the African-American neighbors of mine then had their voice essentially negated. The only thing they had in common with their representative was skin color. And my folks told me that was not the way they wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. They wanted somebody who would look after Savannah and coastal issues. And they saw a district where the population center was in Atlanta, later Augusta, with Savannah as an afterthought. They said, having a black congressman is less important to me than having somebody who will look after the issues that matter to me in my community. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't get anybody to see that by and large, it was, the, it, it, the pressure became overwhelming because there formed this coalition of Tyrone Brooks and Cynthia McKinney who started out as two voices crying in the wilderness, but then they, the pressure to do what was in, deemed to be, as articulated by those folks, my dear friend Tyrone and others, it was deemed to be in the best interest of African Americans. Simultaneously, you had the hue and cry of Republicans saying, this is going to really help us. Right. The ulterior motive. It know. was so hard on folks like me who said, please, in the legislature and in Congress, let us listen to the people in the hearings and do what they want. That is keep my county together, don't split it. Mm -hmm. Keep my city together. If you wanna see which counties should be in a congressional district, go to the mall in the largest city in that each region. Go to the hospital, the big one. Walk through the parking lot and read the county names on the tags and then Add up those numbers and you have your district. Interesting. That's, that's as simple as that. People identify those with whom they have a common interest by the way they shop, by the way they go to the hospital or the doctor, mm -hmm. by the way they share in community development block grants and so forth. Listen to them and do that and let them elect who they want. Black, white, it doesn't matter. And we managed to pass 
state legislative and congressional districts that were like that, recognizing communities of interest. I proposed congressional districts that were within, I mean the minuscule fraction of a point difference between the extreme and unwieldy districts. Mm -hmm. I, I, there was very little difference in the numbers. Mine were lower, sure, but they still protected communities of interest. Well, the U.S. Justice Department, under Republican control, undertook to support the extreme view. I meant to bring you a copy. I was I was named in one of the Northern District of Georgia rulings among the many we went through in court. I was the only legislator named. State Representative Sonny Dixon gave powerful, credible testimony of the extent to which the Justice Department pressed Georgia to optimize the African-American percentages of a limited number of districts. And it, they quoted some of that testimony. I never imagined myself in federal court, but I was the first witness called and I stayed on the stand for hours. Goodness. I didn't realize I'd built such a record, but I had, and I never backed down. And to this day, I believe I was right. Well, we ultimately, after several suits, were forced to redistrict, to adopt what Poythress had recommended in his first present, in the very first presentation before the committee. And that was these unwieldy, gerrymandered districts, which connected very disparate communities based on nothing but race. Here I am with a Pollyanna view again. My neighbor who happens to be black has more in common with me than he does with an African-American from Atlanta. Mm -hmm. I still believe that. But unfortunately, we lost. And what happened was immediate. The congressional delegation completely turned over in the next election. We elected seven Republicans. And that limited what? Four black, four Democrats, three black. Over time, it's become black party, white party. And that is not healthy. To, to me, that divides us just as did desegregation before Brown v. Board of Education, before the Voting Rights Act. Mm -hmm. I may be a lone voice crying in the wilderness, but I'm old enough to say what's on my heart, and I was bold enough to say it in 1992, 93, 94, and 5, all the way through all of those court cases. Mm -hmm. I was one, I, the speaker appointed me one of three conferees to negotiate congressional redistricting on behalf of the House with three from the Senate. And I stayed on it throughout. The other two members from the House were somewhat passive. I was the front gunner and unafraid to articulate what I'm trying to say here, probably badly and overly long. But, not at all. but I, I truly did not see any benefit in dividing the state of Georgia that way. Mm -hmm. Well, it forever changed the state. I wasn't trying to maintain an overwhelming Democratic majority. I didn't give a flip. Let the people elect who they want. Yeah, I was a Democrat, and, right. and I was pressed on that by, the, by various lawyers in the federal court case. I, yeah, I'm, I'm a Democrat. But I have overwhelming respect for a lot of my Republican colleagues. And to me, race should be well down the list. If we, as people of goodwill, can come together and discuss the issue, certainly those things that impact racial minorities should be undertaken. But I conv I'm convinced they will not be undertaken as well when you, when you limit their voice to a small minority. Mm -hmm. Rather than having significant influence in all districts, or most, right. their interests are concentrated in a limited number of districts. That mm -hmm. cannot be beneficial. To anybody who can count, it's ludicrous. And I mean, you were you were saying before you didn't necessarily think it was healthy when there was a Democratic majority when there were not two viable parties. Correct. It shouldn't be one way or the other. No, no. When it, it, it wasn't healthy to have the overwhelming Democratic majority, 
understood where it came from. Mm -hmm. But the early 90s became the, what possibly the biggest turning point in Georgia politics. And you had 1964 in the Goldwater era when Bo Calloway was the first Republican elected. The disenfranchisement with the Democratic movement toward uh, voting rights for African Americans. I can't believe we were that far along in my life before we got, we made that fundamental decision. It, it's, it's awful to think that of what preceded that. that. Mm -hmm. There was also 1948. Here we sit in the Richard B. Russell building. Richard Russell was pressured by Strom Thurmond and, uh, of South Carolina, and he was then the governor of South Carolina, and fielding, fielding Wright from Mississippi. Strom Thurmond became the uh, Dixiecrat nominee. There was another name for the party, but everybody called it the, the Dixiecrat, Dixiecrat party. He became the presidential nominee, and Fielding Wright from Mississippi became the vice presidential nominee, and Richard Russell from Georgia, mm -hmm. who was also of necessity a segregationist. They were different times. You got to be careful how you judge people through a current eye when the circumstances were different then. But he did have the courage to say, no, not going to go that way. Mm -hmm. Richard Russell used to say when people would ask him about what it meant to be a Democrat and how that differed from the conservative Republicans, he would say, we are fiscally conservative, socially concerned. Mm -hmm. And I adopted that mantra throughout my political career. Uh, you know, don't blow the money, figure out whether things are working, but at the same time, care about people. Mm -hmm. Well, we all know how it went. They got what? A million one votes in 48. And then were forced to sign, much as during Reconstruction, they were forced to sign a, a loyalty commitment in 1952, Strom and Fielding and all the others who'd gone that Dixiecrat route. But 48 became a pivotal period. They, the, the Democratic majority began to crumble only a little bit. You, you know, it took... Just enough. Yeah, it took retrospective view to see what happened. Mm -hmm. The Democrats, who, like my grandmother, would never have considered voting Republican, some of them became uneasy much as had Strom Thurmond and Fielding Wright to a, an extreme. They just didn't feel the same allegiance. Correct. Or that the Democrats were having their interests. Right. And then when Lyndon Johnson started saying, you know, we really need to move toward the Voting Rights Act, and that fissure became wider in 1964, but still not enough. It did more, it, more so in other Southern states, mm -hmm. but Georgia was one of the last my period, 91, two, three, the early 90s, mm -hmm. that's when it exploded. That's when we ratified the division of the races so thoroughly that it became black party, white party. And not in a way, when you pointed to 48, you said you saw the crumbling in hindsight, yes, that's pivotal in the midst of that moment you could sense how important what was happening was. In, in, the, in the 90s. In the 90s. I sat down with the speaker, rest his soul. I'm not, I, I, God is my witness. I said, Mr. Speaker, we cannot do this. In some of the suburban Atlanta districts, he was saying, let's, let's put together the Republicans in his, let's take them at what they're asking, but let's, let's get the Cobb Republicans and put them with the DeCab or and let's, North Fulton, and let, let's get the fighting, the warring factions of the Republican Party and jam them together. I said, I love you, Mr. Speaker. You're like a member of my family. And I may be the most naive person on the face of the earth, certainly in the state of Georgia, but I don't agree with that. Keep Cobb intact to, to the extent you can. Put North Fulton with those with whom they identify, whether it's Gwinnett or Cobb. Let the people have the districts they want and let them elect whoever the hell they want, regardless of party or race. Mm -hmm. He said, son, you got a lot to learn. Well, guess what? Here it is a quarter century later and I still haven't learned it. Mm -hmm. 
I believe fundamental to American politics, if you're going to have districts, you put them together based upon communities of interest and you don't gerrymander based on race or party. I still, I believed it then, I believe it now. And the things I predicted sitting there in the speaker's office or building that unwieldy record that got me called before the federal court are, they've proven true, all of them. At time you don't want to be right. <laughs> I really, I'm, I'm, I'm heartbroken that those predictions materialized mm -hmm. because I think we would have been so much better off had they not. Now, you take, for example, the second congressional district. It wasn't gerrymandered. That's Southwest Georgia. Sanford Bishop has been elected without those ridiculously high minority numbers that I spoke of before. Mm -hmm. Because Sanford Bishop is a good, solid congressman who doesn't give a flip about black or white. Sanford and I were together a few weeks ago at the funeral of one of my dearest friends and former legislative colleagues, Bob Hanner from Parrott, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And we talked about all of this. And I just believe the people will elect who they want. I, in, in the middle of Savannah, we had a district that was overwhelmingly African-American majority and let it, and yet it elected, even, even with votes from the black precincts, it elected white folks throughout and then elected an African-American with the whites voting for him. Mm -hmm. And it didn't have to be gerrymandered to accomplish that. You know, when I first ran for office, you didn't ask this, but forgive me. Oh, no, this please. shows where we've come from. When I first ran for office, I had would-be kingmakers from the African-American community come to me. It's the way it used to be in Georgia. And they had what they call ballots. Each of them had folks they would endorse within the respective districts. But you needed to pay to have your name on that ballot. And they would say, well, this is so that we can circulate. And a lot of that money was going to go into the kingmaker's pocket. Okay. You know. And I said, I'm not going to do that. When I was on city council in Garden City, I, I, I found a way to keep the buses running when somebody wanted to stop the city buses coming into the West Chatham County. I got streets paved on Rosignol Hill, which was a black precinct in Garden City. Street lights put up, a community center built, not because I anticipated running for some different office. At that time, I had no idea. It was the right thing to do. And a wonderful woman named Viola Bell God, I loved her. She called me her white son. I called her my black mother. I mean, I loved that woman with all my heart. We, we went in as the two freshman members of the Garden City City Council in 1985. And we looked after the folks who had been disenfranchised. So when the kingmakers came to me and said, we're going to put your name on the ballot, but you've got to give me $10,000 or 5,000 or whatever it was, I said, listen, to me, that's insulting to the people you claim to be representing or be informing. Right. That suggests a monolithic mindset in the African-American community and ignorance or an inability as an individual to make a determination for yourself. Mm -hmm. I said, guess what? I will, I will put myself out in front of the people of Rosignol Hill, the black constituents I have. Take your chances on your record. I said, I'll take my chances based upon the record. I want to knock on their doors just like I knock on the other doors mm -hmm. in every other community. I got 95% of the vote in the black precinct without, without paying the any kingmaker. And it was purely because those people were just like... Everybody else, they observed and made a decision as an individual. And I, to, to me, even though I, you know, some people were saying I wasn't, some extremists said I wasn't looking after the African-American interest in the state. I said, trust me, I am. I'm putting more, I'm showing greater respect to everybody, black or white, and their ability to make their decisions individually and collectively as a community. 
Because if you tell me that I have to have 65% African-Americans in order to elect an African-American, you're basically saying you got to stack the deck because they don't have sense enough to make the decisions for themselves. Hmm. I still believe that way. And Sanford Bishop proves it. And others prove it. African-Americans elected by whites. It, Thurber Baker is a good friend of mine. He was elected. And uh, Mike Thurman, one of my very best friends in life. He went to England with us. We had a blast, mm -hmm. you know. Mike Thurman, elected by whites primarily. You know, quit dividing by race. We should have passed those days. But we ultimately lost in the courts, and mm -hmm. that's what we have. So the Republicans have been the biggest beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. The African Americans, even though certain individuals have been benefited by it, I'm, ta I'm talking about those who were elected because sure. of the stack deck. The overall, overall African American population of the state of Georgia, many of them have been disenfranchised mm -hmm. completely because of it. So yes, that was the radical turning point in the state of Georgia in the early 90s, and it's going to take a generation for us to fix it back. Do you see it shifting now, even despite the fact that we still have the yes. same districting? And it, it, It's shifting just because the demographics are changing. Okay. Uh, Metro Atlanta, for example, uh, Gwinnett County used to be Absolutely, 100% Republican. Mm -hmm. Well, you got a lot more non-whites who've moved in there and their viewpoints are different. And I'm, and I'm speaking of Asians and Latin Americans and more African Americans. We are, we've become more of a mixed society in the state and I think the demographics are gonna shift it. But I'm hopeful that in the next round of redistricting, we'll step back and do what that loud mouth fella from West Chatham County said that got him mentioned in a Supreme Court case. And that is, let the people tell you what they want. Mm -hmm. Draw the districts that way and let them elect who they want, Republican or Democrat, black, white, old, young, male, female, it doesn't matter. It's up to the people. That's democracy. Right. It's so simple, I'm absolutely dumbfounded that we screwed it up so badly. So in shifting just a little bit, but still talking about voting and voters, there was some legislation that you sponsored back in 1997, and it's actually been in the news again recently. Um, that would be House Bill 889. I'm not sure if you remember this exactly, but it was a bipartisan bill that amended a law in regards to voter rolls and how and when voters can be purged from those rolls. So this is back in the news because of the lawsuits and allegations stemming from the 2018 elections. Um, and many are, are holding this up. There are a lot of conservative news outlets who are bringing this up to say that Kemp, as the Secretary of State, was simply carrying out a law that Democrats had had created. You know, I only have a vague recollection of it because I left before the bill moved. Okay. You sponsored it, but then it was I sponsored it at the request of the Secretary of State. And it was 98. And that was done. The Secretary of State was doing it at the request of voter registrars around the state who said, mm -hmm. um, we are really carrying a heavy number of, of, of inactive voters. And this was in districts white, black, it didn't matter. They were all over the state and it was an initiative which was pushed by the voter registrars, as I recall. And the Secretary of State said, okay, we'll, you know, we gotta give you a mechanism to clean up the voter rolls. If you literally have people who are non-participating or maybe they're dead, you know, mm -hmm. you, you have to have a way to get them off the rolls. You have to do some housekeeping. They may have been dead. They, they found, you know, folks who were still registered to vote been dead 10 years. And there needed to be a mechanism to just clean up the voter rolls. It didn't have anything to do with race or party. And the Secretary of State who asked that it be done said that, you know, this is, 
We're responding to what the people are telling us. We manage elections. The people who manage elections locally want a way to do this. Mm -hmm. They want it uniform. So would you carry this legislation for us? And I dropped it in. Uh, of course, I wound up, I, I didn't anticipate this would happen, but I wound up leaving before the legislation moved. And I think it was 98 right. when it was somewhat reshaped and passed. I was long gone. Okay. I was a TV so you, anchor in Savannah then. You introduced it in I introduced it to the request of the legislature on behalf of the voter registrars. And it, it had no sinister motive behind it. It was totally in response to the people who run elections at the local level. Sure. So it, the fact that it's being dredged up now... People can pick whatever weapon they want and tailor whatever the motives were back then to their current bias, but that's crap. It was purely a housekeeping measure mm -hmm. at the time. And, and I don't really have an opinion on what happened under Brian Kemp. You know, maybe it was, I don't know. I'm, I'm far enough removed from it now. I don't know what the motives were, but sure. I know what it was in the nineties and it was just, we used to go up to the well of the house and say, this is nothing but a housekeeping measure. Well, had I been the one to carry it all the way through, that's what I would have said because that's the way it was presented. Mm -hmm. We got a way to get, we got to have a way to get dead people or completely non-participating people or folks who've moved away off the rolls. And right now there's not a uniform mechanism for that. Mm -hmm. And that's all they asked. Now, what went into the debate after I left the legislature, because I resigned in the middle of that term, I had was offered a job I couldn't turn down. Right. And uh, even though I've never count, counted myself a quitter, it, it was a too great an opportunity to miss. And uh, I wasn't going to run again anyway. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, you know, this gave, back then seniority was really, really important. So I okay. thought, okay, this won't be awful. I can, I got Zell Miller. This is not what you asked about, no. but I'm still defending this to this day, the resignation that I did. I, I called Zell, who was a good, good friend of mine. I said, can you, I, let me time my resignation to hit within the windows of your call for a special election. Back then we didn't have uniform special election dates, mm -hmm. but there was one coming and I knew it. And I don't even remember what it was for, but there was a statewide special election coming. He said, he picked the date I timed my retirement so the election of my successor wouldn't cost a, a nickel, and, and it didn't. Mm -hmm. It worked perfectly. And, and my successor, Ron Stevens, who's still in office, a great friend of mine, uh, he was elected and got a leg up in terms of seniority over a huge class that came in in the next general election. So despite what critics said at the time, it worked out perfectly. And, and he was a, he is a Republican. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that seat has now shifted. hundred <laughs> percent, yeah. And it will not, you know, I can't ever imagine it, not, not in the current view, I can't imagine it elected anyone but a Republican. Mm -hmm. We'll see. We'll see. Um, there's so many more things that we could talk about, about your time in the legislature, but you mentioned leaving in 97, so this might be the perfect segue um, into talking about the shift you made from politician to news anchor. Yeah, let me back up for a second though. Sure. Because th there, there are some things that we talked about at the outset and <clears throat> I shared on Facebook the fact that you and I would be having this dialogue and, okay. and everybody from the retired political editor of the Savannah Morning News and a couple of legislative colleagues said, tell them, tell her, Tell her this, okay. tell her that. So you have a list of things. You have well, to... not really a list. And, and, and I know you'd be fearful if I said there was because I can't answer anything briefly. But touching on the harmony between human beings, mm -hmm. regardless of party, mm -hmm. when I was in the legislature, there was a sense of mutual respect. We, we've discussed that. But there are greater illustrations. Uh, well, my friendship with Johnny Isaacson is one of them. Mm -hmm. when, when I retired from TV, which we'll talk about it, as, you, as you mentioned, sure. he actually did a resolution before the Senate. It was, there, was, there was no benefit to be had by him. I was no longer gonna be on television or in politics or anything. He wasn't plowing ground for some future benefit for him. It was genuine. Sure. He said wonderful things. 
and delivered the resolution to me personally. Oh. I mean, it's hard to imagine that. And it wasn't, it was rooted in a different time mm -hmm. when we came to know each other, getting down to the nitty gritty on education and welfare reform and criminal justice reform. I knew him, he knew me. We came from opposite sides of the island, opposite ends of the state. But we formed a mutual respect that we will carry to our graves. There's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. State Representative Van Mueller, south side of Savannah, staunch firebrand Republican, a, a bit uh, histrionic like me. We had a school crossing guard bill one time and she was trying to get the speaker's attention on it. She dressed as a crossing guard and called for the attention of the speaker in the house and the whole place broke up. <laughs> Anne is one of my dearest friends like family. Here I am a Democrat and she's a Republican. When her husband died, I was the first one to her house. She came to me one day on the floor of the house and she said, Sonny, my car is going chugga, 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 chugga. I can't get it to run right. You, you know mechanics. Can you look at it? So when we broke for the day, we took her little minivan and we drove it down I-75 and we got off at an exit and pulled into a Kmart parking lot. I took the breather off of it and I saw a little broken vacuum nipple on the carburetor. Mm -hmm. She's standing there chewing her gum. <laughs> now here you have a Republican and a Democrat standing in the Kmart parking lot and down in Atlanta, Georgia. Fixing a minivan. And I said, spit that gum in my hand. She said, what? <laughs> spit your gum in my hand. She did. And I took that little nipple there on the carburetor and gently moved it into position and stuck that gum all around it and smeared it smooth like a child would Play-Doh, you know? Mm -hmm. And the car and the engine immediately smoothed out. And that chewing gum hardened. And she drove that minivan two more years <laughs> without having any further repairs <laughs> on it. We used to have delegation dinners at her house. She was an, a wonderful cook. And when the Chatham delegation came together, it was families. Mm -hmm. We were black, white, old, young, male, female, Republican, and Democrat. And we loved each other. Mm -hmm. And it can be that way in a broader universe if people would just show respect to one another mm -hmm. and not be divided by systems and gerrymandered lines and such. So, you know, you talk about the, the redistricting that happened in 92 and just how fundamentally changes things. But, and, and scholars debate this and political scientists debate, you know, what causes the Georgia to go from solid Democrat to solid Republican. But there are smaller things here is what you're, you're pointing to. If I'd gotten my way, if we had approved the congressional and the legislative districts, it would have still turned Republican, but it wouldn't have been immediate mm -hmm. because the shift of the South, we weren't going to thwart what happened in the mindset across the, the, the South. As we were discussing before you rolled the camera, mm -hmm. Georgia has a motto in three words, wisdom, justice, moderation. We have a gross insufficiency of all of them. And it's tragic. Mm -hmm. And it is, it, it's creating constitutional crises. But worse than that, it's tearing us apart as a people. And what is the bottom line for an old loudmouth like me who naively argues for what I see as just, I simply fall back on, this, on the words, I'm glad I'm old. Because I will die before this will be resolved. It's going to be a long road back to those It is things. going to be a long road back if ever we get back. And, and honestly, I'm powerless to suggest how we 
go about trying to remedy it. Mm -hmm. It's gone so far. So back to, okay, let's get away from politics. Well, but, but I don't know that we are necessarily. Um, how, how did you make the shift from politics to, to news anchor? You know, there's an, old be there's an old Beatles line that says, life is what happens while you're busy making plans. Well, that's the case with me. I, you know, my, my college education has been hardly applied throughout my life business. Uh, but I enjoyed broadcasting all the while in college. I worked on the campus radio station. Okay. When I came back home to Savannah from University of Florida, I worked on the w WTOC, which was the first radio station in Savannah. And I was the last voice ever heard when the station was sold. And the FCC had rules on ownership, divesting of radio and television stations within the same market. So the Knight family, who had owned all of it, said, well, we'll just sell the whole kit and caboodle. They sold the radio station to a company out of Kentucky the television station to Aflac, and I wound up being the one to sign off WTOC for the last time. Mm -hmm. Well, I just did that as a side job, you know, I was helping to run the family's construction business in the daytime, the business side of it. Mm -hmm. And But I enjoyed the potentiometers and working on radio station, and I cleaned up my southern accent a little bit for radio. <laughs> but when the station was sold, the people who came in, thought that the folks from Savannah had no clue about the radio business. And even though the station was number one in the ratings at the time, all of us from Savannah left, the part-timers and the full-timers. Okay. And the station plummeted in the ratings and they ultimately sold that. But, and it's been sold numerous times since. But the itch was still there. And I was in the family of WTOC, which was the Savannah's first radio and television station. Okay. Close friends with folks on the TV side. After I was elected and didn't have opposition in subsequent elections, I was invited on the air to be the political expert on election nights. Okay. I was the most regular political guest because I lived reasonably near the station. So if somebody canceled for Doug Weathers' viewpoint interviews on the news at five, they picked up he'd the call and say, Sonny, put, I know you're in shorts because that's the way you are, but put on a shirt and tie and come, uh, uh, clean yourself up above the waist and come be my guest because I got a cancellation or I didn't book somebody. So I was probably the most regular guest. In the back of the mind of Doug Weathers, who is a broadcast legend in Savannah, mm -hmm. wonderful guy who believed you earned viewers one at a time, which really resonated with somebody from politics. It was basically approaching the constituency of a television viewing audience the way you would a political district. Learn what your people want and satisfy that need and serve it. Well, he knew the, that I was nutty like he was. I called him and it, it's, you know, people didn't really realize why WTOC got the breaking state news stories first. You but I can reason. say why now. <laughs> I'd call Doug and say, don't you dare say where you got this from, but blah, blah, blah. Well, I was on I-16 headed for a committee meeting in Atlanta. You know, here I was, I didn't want to be in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. I was lucky enough being on the speaker's team to get up really plum appointments. And then with Zell as a good friend, I got appointments from him. Uh, even when I tried to quit in the previous term, I called Zell Miller and Tom Murphy and said, I'm done. I'm one hour away from a news conference saying I'm not running for re-election. The speaker said, son, I sure hate it. I need you, but you know, I you've, been, you've been wanting to quit for the last couple terms. Well, I called the governor and told him the same thing. Went back to tidy up and get ready to leave for my news conference. The phone rang again. Sonny, Zell, I need you to stay with me for this next term. That's my last two years in office and I need you to stay with me. So reluctantly, mm -hmm. I agreed to stay as long as Zell was in office. When the governor calls you personally. Yeah, and he knew my issues. I wanted a Savannah River Parkway run through Sylvania. I wanted Savannah Tech under state purview and a list of other things, Georgia ports and others. They were probably going to happen anyway, but they were certainly going to happen if I stayed. Mm -hmm. And when I, I called... Uh, 
Doug Weathers at the station, I said, you're going to have to get your tips on state news stories from somebody else because the sweet Lord Jesus won't talk me into staying another term. <laughs> I am done. Two months became three, became four, became five in Atlanta with all these committees and being at the call of the governor. Mm -hmm. you know, I was on the committee that made budget decisions in the interim if you had a crisis. And I might get a call in the afternoon and the governor says, I need you there tomorrow morning at 10. Crap, you know. Yeah. It just screwed your whole life up. It was your whole life. I hated it. Yeah. You know, it's supposed to, I had a, by that time I had a, per, a personnel training business, public speaking, time management and such. I had clients across the Southeast, which meant I was traveling all the time. And I literally despised it. You know, I, I'm succeeding beyond my abilities, politically mm -hmm. and in business, mm -hmm. but hated it because I love my wife, I love my hometown, and I was away all the time. So I called Doug Weathers at the TV station and told him what I just said. Mm -hmm. I hadn't driven but a few more miles, <laughs> like Zell had called me before, the phone in the car rang and Doug Weathers said, I got an idea. Why don't you come back to WTOC? I said, Doug, that's been years. And let's face it, I got a face made for radio. I don't see me in television. He said, no, you're just like me. You love the people, you love to serve and blah, blah, blah. He laid it on thick, you know. And But I thought about it and finally said, you know what, this could be, this could be the answer mm -hmm. to, to make my living at home and not have to travel. And he already knew he was retiring. At the time, he didn't let me know his long range view. But okay. yes, he did, he didn't share it. You thought you would just be coming on. I'd just come on and be one of the ancillary reporters and anchors. I said, I do wanna be, I don't wanna be just read news. I wanna be a reporter mm -hmm. and anchor. Uh, you know, he, he said, you've lived the news for all these years. And I said, yeah, but I like asking the questions. I like challenging the norms. I like, you know, it's not like I would come in there with an agenda really other than to expose the truth because I've seen way too many times when it's been hidden mm -hmm. or when there's been an ulterior motive like Poitras re with Reed, and he's a fine man or rest his soul, but you know, he, he had an objective, and but, but nonetheless, I wanted to be the one to expose that. You knew the questions to yes. ask to find. Exactly. I knew what to ask, and I knew things that were hidden mm -hmm. that I could blow wide open and let the chips fall where they may. So I said, I want to be a reporter as well as an anchor if you'll have me, and if the people will put up with it, fine. It didn't take any time to learn the technical side of it. And I got to do exactly what I said. And mm -hmm. I wound up with my hand in m most reporters' stories most days. Mm -hmm. Now, now here, you need to understand, here's the background. Okay. You need to be careful talking to this person unless you talk to this person. You know, get the truth. Mm -hmm. Don't be guided down a path that somebody else wants to take you based on their agenda Expose the truth. It was a blast. And then I, I really didn't anticipate that the success, and I'm still humbled by it. I know my limitations, but you know, I, I, I was pushed by great teachers to be uh, a writer. Mm -hmm. And I was an unyielding uh, school marm when it came to the writing style, trying to get the news away from cliche and simplicity and you know, let it be intelligent Don't and talk to down. people with some respect mm -hmm. and resist the inclination and the pressure from the uh, consultants to go for the sensational, mm -hmm. the misleading. Mm -hmm. Never call it breaking news unless it's really breaking news. Mm -hmm. Don't use that crap. Just tell people the truth. Talk to them. Mm -hmm. Well, you had people with degrees in broadcast journalism who followed what all of the experts told them. And here comes this guy just 
tumbling along from day to day, doing it the way his heart guided him. Mm -hmm. And I become the Emmy Award winner and the Edward R. Murrow Award winner and many, many times AP Award winner. And never one time did I turn in anything for any award. Not once. It wasn't what I was about. Others turned my stuff in. There's a lesson to be learned there. Well, I, I would hope that folks would learn it, that you yeah. don't have to be the Ken doll looking person. You don't have to follow what all the consultants say. Use common sense. Communicate with respect mm -hmm. for the viewers, and they will reward you with loyalty. Mm -hmm. Worked for me. Certainly. So how, how did your time in state government influence how you reported the news? I mean, aside from you obviously knew the right people to talk to and some of the right questions to ask, but would well, you have been I, a different journalist if you hadn't I, been a legislature? If, yes, huge, hugely. The focus groups put politics, if you put, if you single spaced the issues that the consultants tell you you should cover in broadcast journalism, if you single spaced them in a list, Political stuff would be on page three. What I had to do was convince the producers and the brain trust, the ownership, upper management, that the reason for that was because of the way it had been handled before. Make it relevant to people. Show them how it mattered. Bring it down to the local level. Uh, for example, Georgia Ports, you know, it's, it's, an economic issue, but it gets tangled up in the maelstrom of politics. Mm -hmm. Well, look at it from the truck driver's perspective, from the distribution center perspective. Uh, go to Dalton and talk to folks back then and before carpet fell off the hardwood floors, show how the success of Georgia Ports ensures the viability of the carpet industry. Make it more issue oriented and then before they realize it, they're paying attention to a political story. Mm -hmm. And that's the way we went about it. So I was able to identify those issues and at least try, sometimes successfully. Sometimes I'd go to the parking lot at the end of the day and pound my hand on the steering wheel saying, man, I screwed that up. But more often than not, we succeeded in getting people to pay attention to learn from stories that mattered to them. You know, this old, if it bleeds, it leads. Good God, don't be so lazy as to just go after wrecks and crap, you know. Mm -hmm. People will digest, people will pay it. Our ratings were huge and went up and we were going against the grain by sharing with people substantive, meaningful stories that they would have overlooked. Now, here's where I got criticism. People said I was softball with politicians. Interesting. Both ways. Well, my thought was, let me ask the questions that will elicit from them what they want to say. Not, not go into it with a gotcha mentality. Mm -hmm. Let them say what they want to say, and then let the people be the judge. So if I had a Democratic representative on, I asked questions that elicited what they wanted to say. And then I'd turn right around and I'd have Lindsey Graham on because we had South Carolina in our viewing area. Mm -hmm. That's why I really had to hide my Southern accent for what I call the Hilton Head impaired. <laughs> but, but what I'd have Lindsey Graham on from South Carolina, who became a good friend, uh, Mark, oh, what's his name, the former governor of South? Sanford. Sanford, yeah, the Appalachian Trail Wanderer. <laughs> I'd have him on and let him say what he wanted to say. They, and it was interesting because they were then more willing to come by. Every elected official, when they came to Savannah, they would call me. Hmm. So I'd say, you know what, it's not my place to be the gatekeeper. It's not my place to break all the issues down and try to vaunt myself as the one who tripped them up. Mm -hmm. Let them say what they want to say and let people be then informed and make the decisions for themselves. So yeah, maybe they were, now if, if 
you know, I asked Mark hard questions. I would, I would sprinkle in some questions they didn't want to answer. Sure. But more often than not, I just tried to get to the great cadre of issues they were dealing with. Johnny would... All, Johnny Isaacson, mm -hmm. Senator Isaacson, I can't be formal with him because he's such a close friend. Every single time he'd come to Savannah, he'd call and say, all right, we're planning on being there next Thursday. And I got to be here, here, and here. When, when do you want me to come by? And they always got on TV. Mm -hmm. I, you know, hardcore journalists may criticize it. I don't give a crap. It was, to me, it worked. Black, white, old, young, male, female, Republican or Democrat. Let mm -hmm. them say what they want to say and let people the people, people make their own decisions. So do you think people criticized that you were being too soft? Yes. Because they were like, oh, you're, you're one of them. You understand what it's like to be a politician, so you want to make it comfortable. and Without giving away too much, I would come home some nights having interviewed somebody, and I don't want to use any names in this context, but it'd be somebody with whom I had almost no philosophical agreement. Mm -hmm. And I'd walk in the house with my dear wife, who is philosophically aligned with me, and after 38 years, she still hadn't thrown me out. And she'd say, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You sounded like you were hook, line, and sinker in concert with him. Uh -huh. I said, you know what? I owed him the same fair shake that I would give to somebody with whom I agreed. I hated his answers, but I asked the questions that elicited what he wanted to say. Mm -hmm. I hate him with a couple of hard ones out of 10, but... It wasn't what you thought about him. That wasn't... It's not about my agenda. Mm -hmm. You know, it never was my... It, to me, sometimes, if you're just determined to put a hook in every chunk of bait, why... It's becoming about you... It's becoming about a negative mindset. To me, you can elicit, if you're informed, you can elicit the truth without being hard-edged mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. Now, there were some who had gotten themselves ensnared in problems, and they may have been friends of mine, and I would ask about the problems. That, that doesn't, you know, I never shied away from the hard questions if they needed to be asked. Sure. But I didn't feel like I needed to prove myself a Mike Wallace on 60 Minutes with every interview. Mm -hmm. You know, even if I disagreed, it was my job to elicit what was on the mind and the agenda of the particular person. So what do you think about the way that journalism is depicted right now? It's almost, it's almost vilified by politicians and then following from that by the public. I mean, you've alluded to this a little bit in well, earlier. I come from the mold of Edward R. Murrow. Uh, maybe not quite to that extreme, but, y you know, he went after Joe McCarthy pretty hard. Mm -hmm. and, and there are times when you really do have to knuckle down and go for the answers the person doesn't want to give. I've mentioned all the times that I elicited what they wanted to say, and there were those times when you really needed to dig in. Mm -hmm. And often I would, and frankly, it, it became easier because folks knew that I would ask the questions and elicit what they wanted to say, but then, pow, you'd hit them with the one they Sweet did up, not expect. <laughs> Generally, I'd do that on live TV because mm -hmm. they couldn't worm out of it. Uh, good journalists do that. I wouldn't say I was a great journalist in that regard. I was in terms of knowing the issues enough to go after them. I, I think if I had a strength that was in making people eat their vegetables by seasoning them in a way that was palatable, because they needed to know. I felt like I had an obligation to inform them, even if it didn't sizzle, even if it wasn't their favorite flavor. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that's bad. You know, oh. but I also have great respect for true journalists who put their own points of view in their back pocket and approach their jobs asking the, what is it they say on television now? Ask you the hard questions of the powerful or whatever. I, mm -hmm. you know, I hate some of that crap, but <laughs> what bothers me is that some of the really smart journalists I know are denigrated because 
they make Trump look bad or they go against my point of view. Well, guess what? It's not their job to serve you ice cream with your favorite topping. Mm -hmm. It's their job to inform you truthfully. Now, I mentioned CBS News. I am a huge fan of CBS News. CBS has made mistakes through the years. They would admit it. Sure. But by and large, their objective has been true. Bob Schieffer, I know very, very well. Uh, he and others have, in private conversations, we've talked about this correspondent or that, and the ones who are very well educated and very courageous. Bob, when, when he was the anchor at CBS News, we, we even talked about Southern accents. I'd say, you know, one of the things I love, Bob, is you sound like you're from Fort Worth, Texas. He said, well, Sonny, I'm telling you, when I'm at my house on Sea Island and I watch you on WTOC, you sound like you're from Savannah. <laughs> I, I, you know what? Be yourself. Yeah. And people will accept you or not, but mm -hmm. by and large, they'll appreciate it. Sure. And, and he said, Sonny, let me tell you. What, I said, Bob, what are you most proud of in terms of the changes in the newsroom at CBS? I've been there on 57th Street, you know. I was invited up to welcome Katie Couric and all. I, I've been in those studios a lot. Mm -hmm. He said, I'll tell you what I appreciate the most. These brave, brilliant female correspondents. E you know, even those who just hate anything but Fox News, and I I'm sad for them because it is such a shame that they've just been taken in by somebody with a hard right-wing bias. And if, you, and if you know, maybe CNBC is the opposite of that. But CBS is not. Mm -hmm. You watch it long enough, you're going to be mad, you're going to be happy. <laughs> because they don't care. They go after the truth. And when you look at Lara Logan and some of the others with CBS who go in at great personal risk to get the stories in war zones, to report the news accurately in terms of the politics nationally, it's, I have great respect for them. And I mean, CBS News Sunday morning, for the arts and culture, 60 minutes for the hard news stuff and the mm -hmm. CBS Evening News. I watch it faithfully because I know these people to be true journalists. I know some of them lean left, mm -hmm. some of them lean right, but you can't tell it. The ones you think are hard right are actually more left leaning. The truth is they're going after the story and putting their own personal feelings in their back pocket. And that's mm -hmm. the way it ought to be. Now, the problem is news, broadcast news is market driven. You've got a bottom line. Just as Fox has gone after a niche purely for financial reasons. I mean, Fox, the, the founder of the network is no fool. He knew where to make his money right. and it's structured accordingly. And it's a shame that people have been deluded by it. If that's your thing, go ahead, but it's not news. Mm -hmm. Same with anybody who comes from a, a, a totally left-leaning bias. It is a shame when the bottom line, when the sales and marketing side of the situation leaks into the newsroom. The CBS made a conscious decision years ago to say, real news, hard news. Look at the CBS morning news in the morning. It's news, news, news. Mm -hmm. Whereas the other ones are, you fluff. know, entertainment and fluff. And, you know, let's don't dumb it down. Like, I, like we did at WTOC in Savannah. Mm -hmm. Make the Brussels sprouts tasty so you've enjoyed them before you even realize they're Brussels sprouts. Mm -hmm. Well, CBS does that and they've succeeded with it. I, I, I read the New York Times every day. Washington Post, Atlanta Journal-Constitution. I watch CBS and others just to make sure that I'm f finding the right journalists. And, you know, of course, the Savannah Morning News. But then if I quote the, or, or share a Washington Post story with somebody, they say, well, that's just garbage. So Washington, how in the world can you say that? These are many of them Ivy League educated, fundamentally grounded journalists. And 
you know, if you read it every day, you can find, if somebody has a particular bent, it's going to be ferreted out. This, this is intelligent. This is not dumbed down to a bumper sticker. Mm -hmm. This is if you really want to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And it's such a shame because people have been served whatever they want and they begin to accept it as fact, mm -hmm. and it isn't. You need real journalists who can ferret out the truth, no matter what it is. So now anything that bumps up against a person's belief, they don't you want to grapple with it. You just reject it out of hand. If I don't like it, it isn't true. It can't be true. And you, you know, when I, Family members will look me in the eye and say those things, and I, I just sit there dumbfounded. I know you to be smarter than that. Mm -hmm. Why have you, why do you let yourself be deluded in this way? Again, I'm glad I'm old. I'm powerless to find the answer. Oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> I'd like to end this on a, an upbeat note, but I was going to ask you, what and hopefully there is an upbeat answer to this, but what do you see for Georgia politics moving forward? Is there going to be a shift back to Democrats holding a majority in the legislature? And, and if they do, I mean, today's Democrats, the future Democrats of Georgia, how are they the same and different from those that you served with in the 80s and 90s? You know, I, I think maybe... Um and hopefully, the shifting demographics are going to force a more positive result. Mm -hmm. I think as the state becomes more diverse in its population, which is happening largely as a result of Atlanta, and to some degree, immigrants, we didn't touch on that, but you, you, in, in any case, people who came here from somewhere else, just as mine did from Northern Ireland, you know, sure. it's... Uh, as the state becomes more diverse, it's going to be harder to vacuum up any subset of the whole mm -hmm. and limit them as we've done with African Americans in a finite set of districts. Um, I think it's going to be good when we're compelled by the reality of the demographics to simply draw districts, if we're going to maintain them that way, in the way that people want to have them drawn. And then I don't really care how they vote, Republican or Democrat, it doesn't matter to me. I, in fact, I've shifted more to an independent mindset because what we've done, what we've been forced into is extreme left or extreme mm -hmm. right. Well, in and my if, experience, the truth resides somewhere between the extreme. And if you're affiliated with one party, you're all one thing or all another. All one all or all the other. And if you differ on even one issue, out of the pool. You know, mm -hmm. that's sort of sad. So I think as Gwinnett County has done, maybe that's a microcosm of the state as a whole. Just the reality of the diversity of people, neighborhoods that have some of all of the above. Mm -hmm. You can't split them up. It's impossible. Yeah. Can't split this house from that, that, this street from that. So therefore, they get to work together like they want to. Mm -hmm. And then when they make a decision, it has a place at the table. And I think that's good. And I really don't care where it goes, black or white, old or young, male or female, Republican or Democrat. I think we have to recognize that we are Americans. And I read a lot of the debate that was engaged by the founders right on up through uh, well, the Constitutional Convention. I love the Connecticut Compromise of 1787, where they were determining whether it would be a bicameral system, you know, a House and a Senate. Mm -hmm. How would you ensure one person, one vote? When they decided that funding would begin in the House, that each state would have two senators, go back and read all of the debate that went into that. And it was with a a remarkable long-range view that they reached the Connecticut Compromise of 1787. Mm -hmm. And that sort of wisdom needs to come back. And when it does, we will afford to everyone their right to articulate their point of view, 
to join themselves with others of that particular view, engage debate with those of different views, and ultimately come to meaningful conclusions. That'll never happen if you divvy them up unfairly. They saw and anticipated that. Mm -hmm. And I still have great confidence in the decisions that were made by the founders. As long as we don't screw that up, maybe Georgia will move in the direction that they envisioned and we'll all be the better for it. Well, that seems like a wonderful place to stop. Um, Sonny Dixon, thank you so much for sitting with us today and having this conversation. And, and please have no doubt why we asked you to come and sit. You, you gave us so much great Feel information. Feel free to reject it out of hand, trust me. Thank you very much.